Hey, I'm James from Smoking Dad Barbecue, and have I been wrong about reverse flow offset smokers? Well, I have a unique opportunity to do some testing and find out if my biases were actually warranted or I've been missing a hidden gem. Let me tell you all about it. So full disclosure on how this video came to be. I am still a little bit in the penalty box from buying four offsets in the past year so that I could review them 100% independently. And that includes my Smoke North here on Gen 2 behind me. I've sold the other three, but with any resale, I wasn't able to recoup 100% of the cost of buying the pits, using them and reselling them. So I've been trying to avoid the temptation of repeating that and going out and buying every new and exciting pit that comes out and losing a small four in the process. So then where did this beautiful looking reverse flow offset called the Echo from Smoke North come from? Well, to the delight of my family and pocketbook, I am borrowing this. I don't own it, haven't bought it, but as a customer buying three different Smoke North offsets, I was asked as an early customer and supporter, I'm a big fan, I've signed up for their ambassador program because I really believe in the product, to put this pre-production reverse flow offset smoker through its paces and share any features feedback that could help improve the final version. This video is not sponsored, endorsed in any other way, and I'm gonna share good, bad, and ugly as if I bought it. That's always my commitment. Whether I buy it or I don't buy it is to review things in a 100% genuine way that I would refer to my friends, family, as well as any of you watching along. So now that you know where that comes from, I always think it's important with YouTube to disclose any potential bias or affiliation that might exist in a video. So this is here for a good time, not a long time, uh, but I'm gonna review it absolutely as if I bought it, and thankfully, I didn't have to do that this time. So before we do a walk around and first fire in the Echo Reverse Flow, I am a big believer in you put your money where your mouth is. And so why, when I was in the market for an offset smoker, did I skip right past the Reverse Flow category? So for me, there were three main reasons why I skipped right past the reverse flow as a category when I was looking at my first offset. Over the last 15 plus years or so, I've been doing grilling and smoking on a variety of other grills from live fires to pizza ovens to Kamados to kettles. I've used a couple offsets, but I never owned one for myself. But as of late, I have several grills. Some would say, namely my wife, Sarah, that I even have too many and they all share in common a heat signature coming from down below. So when I was looking in the market, I already have plenty, too many uh, grills where we are getting our direct heat from the bottom and trying to get some of that convection air or heat to radiate down on the top. So for me, getting a different heat signature than what I already have too much of was priority number one. And this is something that a direct flow offset style provides. Second on the list for me was the cost, weight, and shipping. So in no uh, particular order, the weight isn't a concern. Even though my Huron Gen 2 is nearly 900 pounds, having large casters, I can move it around almost single-handedly in the backyard, no problem. So I'm not really concerned about the weight from me being able to move it, but where this shows up is in the cost and the shipping. Anyone who's actually gone through the final stages of buying an offset, there's the price of the offset, but this seldom reflects the true cost delivered to your backyard. And so part of this is being in Canada, there's huge border taxes coming across. So for example, if I wanted to get a mill scale 94 into my backyard, I had a quote several years ago for $14,000 Canadian, which is like three times the cost of the pit. So there's the cost of the pit, and then there's actually getting it into your backyard. Thankfully, the same is not true for pits made in Canada. So I was able to get local shipping, which is why Smoke North first hit my radar. And this is also a benefit into the state. So for some reason, the reverse is not true. You can ship a pit made in Canada with all domestic steel into the US and you don't have the same cross-border duties, nor according to Smoke North's website, do you pay the end user tax in your state. And so this comes in a material savings. I've had many people write me notes that have picked up a Smoke North of their own and found huge savings when it comes to the tax uh, and the shipping. And last but not least in the three reasons why I skipped right past the reverse flow uh, several years ago when I was looking was this conception or misconception, which I'll elaborate on in just a second, around the authentic Texas offset experience. So the first era is sort of anything pre-1900. This is where we're digging a hole in the ground, burning some fire down to coals, and cooking directly over live coals. It wasn't until around 1896, according to the article I read in Texas Monthly, I'll link to it down below. It's worth the read, by the way, if you're a subscriber to uh, check that out. But this is where there started to become um, some momentum around direct cooking, but using brick ovens. And you started to see this spread across the state as well as the country as this solved some problems in terms of 
fire risk in terms of a restaurant burning down or when it started to become widespread and make its way into the backyard. Again, the article even cites how neighbors may be not pleased with digging a hole in your backyard and smoking an ox or something like that in the pit. This is practical cleanliness, smell, as well as making it easy and accessible to more people to enjoy. So this era of the brick oven direct cooking was largely popular from 1929 all the way up to 1968. 1968 is when the patent was first filed for a rotisserie smoker, and I'll come back to that a little bit later, but things remained, again, relatively unchanged up until in 1983. That's when the first commercially available for the home consumer offset smoker became available and it has taken the market over by storm. So much so that you may be forgiven for not even remembering there's any other styles of cooking like Hill Country Barbecue before that. And there's another great Texas Monthly article I'll link down below that talks about some great places still doing Texas traditions and cooking over live coals. That's another uh, great read. But the offset form factor has not only taken over commercial kitchens, it's also uh, become the number one tool of choice in the backyard. That is though, up until recently for the third article that I'll link below, which is the resurgence of the rotisserie smoker. There's a couple, this is not widespread, but you can't help but wonder if we'll look back at this in the future and say, this is the next era in Texas barbecue, but recently some restaurants, and we're talking 2020 and forward, have actually started discarding their offset smokers and moving back to the rotisserie form factor that first showed up in 1968. This is all a summary again of those great reads from Texas Monthly, but the three main reasons in the articles around some restaurants moving away from an offset to another form of cooking centers around three main issues. The first is capacity and footprint. How much can you actually fit in the amount of space that's being taken up by the offset? And you can see that in any offset smoker, whether it's directly coming out of of the firebox, which many backyard offsets are trying to find ways to mitigate that blasting effect coming directly out of the firebox. You've got things like baffles, deflectors. My design on my Huron has a, a water pan and a deflector plate to help manage some of that air so I can get as close to the firebox uh, as possible. Other designs uh, like the brand new Goldie's Pit, you've got uh, hot air being piped in directly right in front of the food. And even in their demo video, you can see uh, some care going on to avoid that hot spot in the grill. This is not unique to Goldie's. All offsets where you have a hot firebox, you have these high heat gases racing into the cook chamber and there's a number of different ways uh, that you can solve for it. The other hot spot traditionally is over by the collector where you've got your chimney smokestack pulling that hot air so you get a bit of that rainbow effect of the direct flow offset where hot spot directly out of the firebox and another hot spot near your collector and so this limits the capacity even if you're getting a larger cooking grid this is why smaller offsets in my opinion just don't make as much sense i had a blast cooking with my affordable oklahoma joe's it's a couple hundred bucks 30 gallons my next offset was 60 gallons then 85 gallons now the 110 gallons behind me but if you're going to go through the trouble of running a live fire all day and get the amazing food that an offset can produce. You want enough for your family and to share it with friends and neighbors. And this is just something that's not possible on these marketed small backyard offset pits because by the time you account for those two hot spots, the usable cooking surface is incredibly small. And this is one of the main reasons in the Texas Monthly article, some restaurants are starting to move away from the offset is they're just not able to get enough capacity for the amount of space that has to be dedicated to the smoker itself. Second is directly related to this, which is the cost of fuel. I'll put the exact quote here but one restaurant cited that they are able to double their capacity in the same footprint and use half the wood since we're not losing as much space uh, to hot spots and able to get much closer to the outer perimeter of the grill and or add extra racks there are some very real and practical differences when it comes down to the cost of owning and operating these pits and last but not least perhaps least relevant to us is the ability of attracting and retaining qualified labor for running an offset properly. There's a couple other form factors like rotisserie or perhaps even the reverse flow are a little bit easier or less prone to operator air. And if you're a commercial restaurant, these things matter. So while a few restaurants does not mean the end of the offset era, it does highlight a couple practical advantages that I may have been too quick to dismiss about the reverse flow offset in terms of, is it something that you should consider or not? So based on everything that I've learned and experienced through the years, reading as well as owning several different offsets, there's 
four potential advantages that I want to quantify and put this offset through its paces. Let me know if there's more down in the comments, by all means, happy uh, to add those, but no particular order. The four advantages that I'd like to uh, qualify include the usable grid space. I'll show you an overlay here. I, I took the brand new, it's nice and shiny, cooking grid out of the Echo, which is about 95 gallons in terms of overall tank size and capacity, and put it in my Huron Gen 2 at 110 gallons. And you can see it is taking up more space than previous examples where I've used green tape to mark the usable grid space. It nearly is a one-to-one -one match for an offset much larger. This speaks into point number two, and I'll get the exact dimensions and put it down here, but trying to line it up by eye, it's at least a me width, if not approaching two feet less in overall packaging size. This could open up some potential if you are looking to fit it in your backyard offset, and this whole outdoor uh, kitchen that we built a couple years ago, the original plan was to be able to uh, fit an offset in here. But as I shared earlier, if you're gonna have an offset, it's worth being able to fit enough food. And once I learned that I need a larger offset to get a larger workable area, I quickly ran out of space in being able to fit any sort of offset smoker that, that could turn out the quality and quantity of food that I would want for having a dedicated offset smoker. So instead they live over here, but the Echo's form factor and packaging is about two feet feet less in overall size. So this opens up for people who are space constrained, a great option. One of the number one questions that I get in email, direct messages, Facebook, or anything like that is how difficult is it to control a fire? And while it definitely takes some practice, I put together, if you haven't seen it, by the way, a dedicated fire management video on different fires and techniques. There's some great instruction online not to take anything away from those who have gone before me and shared their tips, but the tips that are shared for a thousand gallon offset smoker just don't translate down to a backyard size. Things like 30, 60, even 85, or the 110 gallon offset smoker. There's some different nuances of how to build and run a great fire in a backyard size offset smoker. And the reverse flow offset design introduces a couple things that might make it easier for a novice to run a great fire. First, we have that large, heavy steel baffle. It's going to help mitigate the potential from a runaway fire and shooting our temperatures way up since we have a larger area of dispersing that radiant heat and cooling it off before some of those hot gases uh, are presented to our food and drawn back across the chamber. Another potential ease of use benefit is that you can fill that chamber up with water and water acts as a great stabilizer. So we should be able to, uh, once up to temperature, maintain a smoother temperature for a longer period of time and potentially get some increased efficiency out of our wood, which again, in theory, would reduce the cost of running the pit itself. And last but not least is the conductive heat. This was originally, this is number one on my avoid a reverse flow offset smoker because I have plenty of grills that have conductive heat, but with a couple of years under the belt, there are some advantages in terms of how long it takes to cook food. In a, any grill, you have these different heat properties, but we have conductive heat, which is perhaps, you know, in my Kamados, I run into this all the time, where you've got something like your brisket sitting directly above deflector plates with a live fire underneath of it. This is potentially going to overdo the bottom. So conductive heat, can be a good thing, but it can also be a challenge that we need to manage. A brisket long slow cook with fire underneath of it isn't necessarily the most optimal way of doing things. Next, we have a convection airflow. Since I'm mentioning a Kamado, they're very energy efficient and there's barely any air moving through that. I did a recent test comparing my Kamado Joe with the slow roller, which is supposed to move air 20 times more. And at the same temperature using an aerometer, measured the convection airflow coming out of my Huron on Gen 2, and it was about 20 times more air at the exact same temperature coming out of the offset. And there's no cheat code for this. This is what helps give offsets their signature clean but penetrating smoke flavor that you just can't replicate on a variety of other grills. So now that we've set the stage for what I think would be great to test, let me know if I've missed anything again uh, in the comments as I've got some time to continue to play with this before having to send it back. Be more than happy to add that to the list. Let's get into our walk around and build a first fire and I'll also grab some probes and we can start to test the heat signature across the grates on the lower level as well as the upper level. Let's walk around. So a lot of similar features to my Huron Gen 2 that I kept as well as my Carlisle, but if you're unfamiliar with Smoke North, a couple of these accessory upgrades and things that are included. Uh, one of my favorites is the wood shelf. Uh, I think this makes a huge difference, particularly if you're not in an outdoor kitchen, having a place to set your ribs. Uh, we've got 
really nice. I like the fact that we've gone a, a bit more of an aggressive knurling on the handle. I like that grip. This is more aggressive than what was on my Gen 2, which was an early build. Uh, we've got a Teltru temperature gauge, as well as this new sort of dome cap for the reverse flow to help uh, redirect some of that uh, airflow. I've also got the optional rib rack. And even though uh, we've not done our testing here, I've already made an ask. There's space to, I think, get away with another level. So if we wanted uh, to add another grid uh, or move this lower and do two briskets, I think that would be a great option to be able to drop this and get um, maybe three briskets, perhaps four on the bottom, and then double that up. This would turn this into a real powerhouse in the backyard. We have our top rack rib, which is on uh, the slider. So I can bring that right out and push on that. That's supported, not going anywhere. As well as the main grid, which new is also on the same slider system. So if I want to just lift that up, I could pull that out. And again, it's uh, supported on those rails. And down below, the lighting is not great, but this is where you can see the large baffle plate. So there's no open access to our firebox below. Uh, and this is on a bit of a grade down towards the drain plug. So if you wanted to fill that up with water and use that, uh, you absolutely could do that. So the heat, uh, again, lighting is not great, but that is where the heat would come up from underneath the baffle plate and then uh, start to be drawn across the top of our offset back down towards the collector and out the five inch chimney stack. Like on all Gen 2s, we've got a, a, a probe plug if we wanted to route some um, temperature probe wires directly in and not have any uh, smoke leaks. And then we've got our damper control where we can uh, seal off the top of our chimney if we wanted to completely extinguish our fires. Also really glad that the flat top on the firebox uh, is available. I use mine for a number of different things. Whether you want a warm wood splits, there's more than enough space to fit all the splits that you would be adding. But this gets up to, at least on my pit, we'll test it, uh, 270 or so degrees Fahrenheit uh, year round. And this is a perfect temperature for simmering sauces. Uh, so we'll definitely give that uh, a check. And then, uh, like before, it's the same semi-insulated firebox. And if I can get in here and show you, there's shelves. So if we were to grab a wood split and you wanted to have them up here and preheat them so they get nice and warm and staying out of the way of the fire, uh, you could preheat your splits and then drop them down uh, into your fire and have no issue doing that. I don't have it installed uh, right now, but I also have the optional charcoal grate accessory. So this is a, a multi-tool that you can use either to hold your coals up off the semi-insulated firebox, which honestly I never use. Uh, that way I'm fine with the coals directly in the firebox. Uh, or you can use this for searing a steak. I've done cast iron potatoes in the Dutch oven, or I've even started experimenting and turned out some amazing pizza. And so I've used this thing for everything from cooking chicken savaki, potatoes, corn on the cob, steaks. In my opinion, this is probably one of the best accessories I've ever bought for any offset that I've ever owned because it just opens up a whole bunch more cooking. And then we've got this uh, powder coated uh, log rack uh, on the bottom. If you wanted to uh, store your wood underneath the cover and keep everything safe. So with all that, let's grab some wood, start our first fire. I always like to start with some kiln dried grocery store. This is birch wood as it will come up to temperature. It's almost like paper and not a lot of humidity, but it'll light really quick and easy. And we don't have to wait too long to get a great coal bed. So let's grab our grill blazer grill gun, fire this up. All right, that looks good. Let's give this a couple minutes to help heat soak our pit and then get some heat into our smokestack so that we are drawing properly. See you in a couple minutes. Okay, let me show you where we're tracking. I'll explain which probe is what in a second, but air temperature, I'm reading about 240 degrees, just above that 225 mark and just below the 250, so I'd call that 240. I placed my Chef Temp Quad Pro probes across the entire grid, so probe Number one is all the way in this corner, probe number four, uh, all the way over by the firebox. And so they're reading uh, 234 to 237. So we're within three degrees uh, all the way from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. And our two probes in the middle, uh, as you'd expect, are almost uh, right on each other. So let me show you where those are and I'll move them up to the upper level. So again, probe one, probe two, probe three, and probe four covering our entire cooking grid. So those were nice and even. Um, I'll get a high heat glove <laughs> versus just uh, grabbing those and move it up to the top. 
And then just to show you the warming shelves, as I mentioned earlier, and I think we're getting ready to add some wood, uh, but I can fit sort of two splits uh, front to back on each side. So I've got four splits that should be ready to go. I'll just grab the tripod. We can add that wood uh, and then move our temperature probes. So I've just built the Jerby fire configuration that I have been loving in my Huron as this gives me, like clockwork, one hour of fire at 270 degrees. So it's two logs on the bottom that have been preheated. And then these three logs are quite tight together. Uh, which is helping knock down the fire. I mean, I've got the door open right now, but you can see sort of the air pulling it fairly aggressively towards our cook chamber. So there's some great draw going on. Let me close the door and go move those probes. We'll keep the order of everything the same. I'll place probe number one here on my left and probe four. Let's close that up and let it stabilize and we'll check the temps on the second level in a minute. On our second level, so probe one far left, is 243 to probe number four, uh, which is far right, 240. So that's within uh, three degrees of each other. And then uh, probe number two in the middle on the left and probe number three middle on the right. Those are also uh, so three and a half uh, degrees apart. Uh, so I'm really impressed. Both top and lower levels are running with no more than a spread of the three, four degrees Fahrenheit across the entire surface of this reverse flow. Well, color me impressed, at least from a data and a potential perspective. If you've been following the channel for a while, you know I like to review products over several months versus doing an unboxing and a review because there's just so much little nuance and detail and experiments that we need to run before we can go into a full-fledged review. But next up is my first cook. So let me know down in the comments. I'm between something like St. Louis ribs or going straight for a brisket or <laughs> let's be honest, we're gonna do both at some point. But let me know what you'd like to see first down in the comments and I'll add that to my upcoming first cook on the Echo Reverse Flow Offset Smoker by Smoke North. That's it for today though. I'm James from Smoke Dad Barbecue signing off and remember, don't be afraid to fire it up.